director of the cost analysis program here at AFIT. Uh, and, and what I want to tell you about today is what I think is probably uh, the greatest opportunity uh, that you'll ever find uh, in the Air Force. And, and that opportunity is to uh, be like a Division One athlete where you go to school for free, but it's even a little bit better where uh, you get you paid at the same time. So uh, this is an opportunity to spend 18 months uh, getting paid, uh, going to school for free, and to, uh, to get a master's degree. And so that's kind of uh, what I want to talk to you about today. So I'm not going to go over much uh, history. I just got like one slide on, on AFIT itself, um, because I'm going to assume that uh, many of you have probably heard about AFIT, the Air Force Institute of Technology. And probably what you know about AFIT is more likely on our continuing education side. So a lot of students come through here. We get thousands of students come through AFIT on the continuing education side. And what I'm going to talk to you today about is our graduate school. Okay. So uh, AFIT as an institute, it does continuing education. Uh, it does the, the graduate school. And then, of course, we do uh, a lot of research and, and consultation um, uh, out of AFIT. AFIT is one of the two DOD uh, graduate schools. Our counterpart in the Navy is the Naval Postgraduate School, NPS, if, you, if you've heard of them. Um, <clears throat> and the, the, the Naval Postgraduate School uh, and AFIT, they've kind of divided up in some senses uh, some of the programs. There are some uh, duplications between them, but when it comes to cost analysis, uh, AFIT is the only program that offers an in-resident uh, cost analysis program. You're going to see uh, on that little graphic over here on the right, um, kind of the, the break of what we get here at AFIT for our student population. For the most part, it's Air Force officers. About about three quarters of the students are Air Force officers. Uh, we do get a small amount of enlisted. Uh, we're getting more and more civilians uh, in the cost program in particular. Uh, our civilian uh, enrollment is going up. Staff FM is making uh, an effort to uh, uh, bring the civilian perspective into the program. We also do get some sister service folks. So we've had um, Army students in the past, Navy students in the past, Coast Guard students. And uh, we also get international students. We've had students from Greece, Turkey, uh, South Korea, uh, a bunch of different uh, bunch of different countries. AFIT as a whole has 13 PhD programs and, and 23 uh, uh, master's programs. So if you want to think about the AFIT graduate school, I think of you know uh, the Air Force Academy, right, the Air Force's undergraduate school. AFIT then is, is that next level uh, you need to get a, a master's degree or a PhD. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to, to stop me along the way. So this next slide, um, you know, is not a slide that I came up with. It's not, it's not Colonel Richard's view. Uh, this is from, from staff at FMC. Uh, because anytime you want to do something in the Air Force or, or any job, you know, what's the relevance of it? Why, why does it matter? Uh, why does it exist? Okay. Um, if you're going to come to AFIT, you, you want to know that you know the reason that you're doing it is relevant to the Air Force, uh, relevant to your job, uh, relevant to your career path. And so, uh, again, this isn't a slide that I have developed. This is one that I'm, I'm borrowing, um, and, and this is their perspective on why uh, the graduate cost analysis, that's the GCA, that's the GCA up there, graduate cost analysis, and why that program matters. Okay. And the first point they make is you know to the Air Force, and really this would be to the DoD. You know, I, as, as we all know, uh, the wars are drawing down, uh, the budgets are becoming tighter, right? That's not news to anybody in, in this room. Uh, there's no uh, relief in sight. So there's more and more emphasis um, really on improving costs. And if you if you saw the, the email that came out today on the, the Comptroller magazine and read some of those uh, or even skimmed through some of those um, different articles that are written there, a lot of it is about uh, improving uh, our insight into cost and to uh, making better decisions. So that kind of brings us to the second point, which is the corporate resource allocation process. Um, more and more, the, the cost professional is being brought into this process. So if you know Ms. Water, um, who's the senior coster up at, uh, up at staff at NC, um, she has been brought into the, the corporate process. She sits there uh, to help the Air Force decide how are we going to, you know, how are we going to our budget? Where are we going to make these decisions uh, in order to to make the the best use of our dollars? Um, more and more, those decisions, such as do we want to um, continue to U2 or do we want to use Global Hawk? Um, what's the what's the dollar trade-off between those? 
what's the bang for the buck between those two platforms. Those are all decisions that they look to the costers, the cost professionals, to tell them, um, you know, what does this decision make? Really, what's the impact um, that it's going to have? So she's really um, becoming ingrained in that process, and she's really taking the, the FM position. It's not the budget side, it's really the cost side uh, that she's brought in there um, to help better inform those types of, of decisions. The, the third sub bullet out there to the acquisition community, that's really kind of our bread and butter. So uh, the folks that come through AFIC, if you come through this program, uh, when you leave here, you're going to go out and be part of the acquisition community for a period of time. Uh, that's usually your various uh, product centers, whether they are at uh, Wright-Patterson, Hanscom, um, LA, Anglin, uh, those types of places. You're going to help try to figure out, you know, uh, what's the best path forward? What is it going to cost for the next generation bomber? Uh, what's the cost of um, the KC-46 and Anchor? Um, all those types of uh, big dollar uh, decisions are informed by the work that the, the cost folks do. Okay. And the last point that they make is get to the cost community. So, you know, the, this program is important to them because it gives them that edu educated group of people that they can draw, on, draw from to, to help them make those kinds of decisions. Okay, so those are all kind of the, the big picture things, and, and I kind of want to just talk a little bit more about what this program is, okay? It's, a, it's an 18 month, so it's a year and a half uh, in resident program here at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, the students uh, arrive at the very end of August, so this past week, uh, we've had our latest group of, of students arrive. Uh, they'll be here for 18 months, so they're going to graduate in March of 2016. The program itself, so you have a week or so of orientation at the end of, end of August. Uh, the program itself then is there's a, a one-month refresher course. Uh, and this happened uh, during the month of September. So these are non-credit uh, courses where you get to kind of, you know, ease back into school to spend a little while. Uh, get a little refresher on your math, your algebra, your calculus, those kinds of things. Uh, get a refresher on, on your writing skills. Kind of ease you back into uh, being a full-time student. Uh, you also get the opportunity, if you don't have any acquisition background, which uh, a vast majority of our students don't coming in, um, and, and as I'm going to show you kind of the, the notional career path later on, that's kind of the, the way that that uh, the staff at them uh, views um, how they want people to come in. But if you don't have any kind of acquisition background, you also get a chance to take a, a DAU uh, online course during that short quarter to just make sure you're familiar with some of the terms so you're not overwhelmed um, when, when, the, when the full quarters start up in, in October. And so starting October is the first of our six quarters. We have six quarters then of, uh, of graduate study, uh, which gets you out the door in right about 18 months. Uh, there are breaks between every quarter, uh, so you know, uh, so you can take leave, uh, there's no issue there. There's usually one to three weeks of time between any given quarter, uh, so you can take care of your personal business, uh, go on vacation, relax, or do those kinds of things. Another big benefit uh, when you're at AFIT, so once you're here, you're here. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is you're, you're not going to get tapped for a, a deployment, you're not going to get pulled out for some kind of additional duty. Um, you're going to be here uh, full time, um, safe uh, from any of those types of activities, so you can fully uh, focus on going to school um, for the, for that year and a half period of time. And when you come out, uh, you have basically a, a three year payback tour. Uh, so you'll be uh, a cost analyst in one of our uh, advanced academic degree uh, coded positions. There's about 40 of them uh, across the Air Force, and typically. Students go to either uh, Andrews, uh, which is where the Air Force Cost Analysis Agency is located. Uh, some stay here at Wright Patterson. Uh, some go to LA. Um, Hanscom is another place students have gone. Uh, Anglin has uh, a few AAD slots, and even uh, Peterson in Colorado has, has one slot out there. So essentially, you're going to go to one of the one of the major acquisition bases, and or uh, or I should say for the Air Force Cost Analysis Agency. So you can apply directly uh, what you learned here at AFIT in your follow-on job. So I just kind of threw this up here to, you know, say graduate education is different than undergraduate education. Uh, and undergraduate education um, is kind of uh, unidirectional, if you will. 
uh, where the information is kind of given to you, uh, you're supposed to uh, regurgitate essentially back uh, to the professor in, in some kind of a, a test. Uh, under, uh, graduate education is a little bit different. It's really teaching you to, to learn how to learn. Um, there's a lot more ownership uh, in the process on the part of the students. And so it's much more open-ended. And, and we discuss uh, things, much more of an open discussion type environment. So here's just uh, some of the things that we, we talk about and or research um, while, while you're here at AFIT. So um, maybe it'll be looking at, you know, modernization versus new development decision. Um, you know, what are the pros and cons? Um, what's the, the life cycle cost, um, not just the acquisition cost? Uh, between doing these kinds of things. We try to incorporate um, current events. So in one of our econ classes, we had a project this past quarter about, you know, President Obama's proposal to raise the minimum wage. Um, you know, what are, what are the impacts of that? What are the impacts uh, on poverty? Uh, what are the impacts on unemployment? Um, does it affect the, the, the rate of unemployment? Uh, these are all the, the types of discussions that we have. So we can look at it from, you know, what does the theoretical model say is going to happen uh, if the minimum wage is increased? And then we can go look and say, well, what are the empirical uh, studies that have looked at this thing? And, and, and try to understand both the pros and cons of, of various policies. Same thing with um, budgetary impact. So obviously they had the, the Budget Control Act of 2011, which uh, is going to take out $487 uh, billion over 10 years. Um, what's the impact of the deficit? Uh, what's the impact of the Air Force? Uh, how do we measure the deficit? Is it a, a big dollar amount? Is it a small dollar amount? Um, all those types of, of questions are, are things that we look at. Um, from a research standpoint, uh, students look at things like, you know, we have all, all these um, uh, studies on cost growth. You know, what are indicators that will help us predict uh, whether a program is going to have cost growth or not? Um, if acquisition reforms are enacted, have they been helpful? Uh, have, have things like um, uh, with SARA, the Weapons System Acquisition Reform Act of 2009, uh, has it had a positive or negative impact on our cost growth and our schedule growth? Uh, these are the types of questions uh, that we try to, to answer and research and, and discuss um, uh, in this program. So uh, what does the program actually look like? So here's the, the course sequence. Um, and this slide gives you the, it's again at six quarters, it gives you the first uh, three quarters here. So this is what the students who just arrived are going to take. Uh, you're going to see they're going to take four classes each uh, on the first three quarters. You're going to get a lot of those analytical decision support type skills out of this program. So if you look through this, just for example, uh, in the first quarter, you're going to have a statistics class. Okay? You're going to have an, an operations research class. Uh, to help you understand uh, things like linear programming um, and how to make uh, uh, decisions. And you're going to have an introduction uh, type class to the system engineering process uh, because to be a good cost estimator, uh, you've got to be able to communicate with the engineers out there who want you to understand from their perspective the things that they're looking at. And then, of course, you're going to have pure cost analysis classes like we have here, uh, the initial class principles of cost estimating. And you'll see that kind of theme uh, follows on. So even if you look at the winter 15 uh, sequence of classes, you have a follow-on statistics class. Uh, you have another operations research class where you uh, learn the decision analysis techniques. Uh, we have a research methods class because you're going to do a research uh, thesis uh, while you, during your time at AFIS. So we're going to kind of teach you what are different methods that you can apply, both qualitative and quantitative, to conduct research. And then, of course, uh, follow on in a more advanced cost analysis class. So that just kind of gives you a feel for uh, how many classes you'd be taking uh, and the sequence of them. So it's, it's four classes each for the first three quarters. And then we dial back the classes for the next three quarters. So in the summer, uh, you take two classes, and then you begin your thesis research. So your thesis is, is something that is a practical uh, problem that someone in the DOD, uh, usually the FM community, has come up with, and they want one of our students to, to look at it. Uh, an example of one is um, one of the students from South FMC, they're trying to figure out a better way to predict um, uh, foreign currency. Uh, so they've got a very sim simple method um, that they're using right now, it's basically a weighted average, and they're asking us, hey, is there a better, more accurate way uh, that we can predict um, what we should have for our, for our foreign currency accounts. And so we've got a student who's, who's looking at that. 
And so he's very that this summer. Uh, in the fall quarter, you're down to one class. We have a major lead time class, and then you do a bulk of your research um, during this time. And then in the very last quarter, uh, you have two uh, cost classes, and then you're finishing up your your uh, your thesis research at that point in time. So four classes for three quarters, uh, two classes in the summer, one class in the fall, and then uh, two classes in the winter. So you get to focus more on the research aspect. So what do you leave with when you come out of AFIT? Well, a couple of things. The obvious one is you're going to have your master's degree. Right, you're going to have a master's of science in science and cost analysis. So that's that's number one. Uh, the second thing, and this is this is great. It's only been uh, for the last few years that this has happened. But uh, all these DAU courses that I've got listed here, and I've got a type of that should be EVM, not EFE. Um, uh, those are all uh, DAU courses that you get uh, fulfillment credit for by coming to this program. And so what that does is it gives you the vast majority of the classes that you need. Uh, to get your, your APDP uh, level 1, level 2, and level 3 certification. Now, it's not giving you the uh, experience part of it. So, to get those certifications, you have to have a certain amount of years of experience coupled with the classes, but it does get you the, the vast majority of the classes. Um, during your time at AFIT, it's an 18 month program. Um, the staff at FM has said, well, we'll give you one year of uh, experience credit. Okay, so you do get one year of, uh, of acquisition credit. Uh, for your time here uh, at school. Uh, the other thing that we offer during graduation week is there is um, a organization called the International Cost Estimating and, and Analysis Association. They're a dot org, uh, but they're really the only um, uh, international uh, or national uh, organization that is really directed towards what we do as, uh, as cost analysts in the DOD. So they have a certification exam. Um, we help you prep for it. Uh, and then it's optional for you whether you want to take it or not at the end of the program. Uh, it's been basically 100% pass rate for the students that have taken it out of this program. So um, we really think that we get you prepared uh, in order to, to do that. And the last thing is, you know, you worked hard on this thesis and we'd like you to be able to disseminate that information out to other folks. So uh, we encourage everyone to try to um, publish uh, their thesis into a journal article. And uh, you know, hopefully, um, we can get that accepted uh, by someone before you before you leave here. Uh, so that's kind of uh, what you leave with. The the thing that people always ask and and, and that people are concerned about is, well, okay, that all sounds great, um, but how does it affect me in my career? Right? Um, the stereotype is, you know, hey, it's bad for my career to be out out of it for eighteen months of school. Um, and so staff at FMC, uh, when I told them I was talk to you guys today, wanted me to bring up uh, these two points from the latest uh, DT this past summer. So this is kind of hot off the presses. Um, and this lets you know what the senior leaders in FM think about uh, getting your, your master's degree here at AFET. Um, and as you can see, 50% of the squadron commanders they selected this summer uh, have AFET degrees. And, and the reason is they are seeing uh, a large value from the analytics and decision support uh, that the folks who come through and get those skills uh, can provide to the wing commander when, when they're the their squadron commander. Um, so uh, big emphasis on, on asset degrees. Um, so much so that they are most likely uh, going to start uh, giving more weight, uh, in other words, points when they score your records for various things like school selection, uh, like ACSC, uh, Air War College, that kind of thing, um, to those people who've gone through AFIT and have the AFIT degree. So the, the point is, senior leaders in FM uh, value this, and they're trying to reflect the fact that they value this in the decisions that they're making uh, for folks as they go through and uh, progress in, in their career. And maybe you've seen this, and maybe you have this one of the kind of hot off the, the presses kind of things. Um, we got a copy of this this past spring. But this is essentially um, trying to show that they want folks to get experience not just on the O&M side, not just on the investment side, but they want them to get both. Uh, and so this is kind of their notional way forward, and they think about a third of the folks coming in are going to follow this path where what 
they want is they want you to go and have uh, a base level O&M type assignment for your first assignment, uh, three years or so. Then they want you to come and get your master's degree here at AFIT. Uh, following AFIT, go and do your payback tour and acquisition, okay? And then you're going to kind of bounce back and forth uh, between the two, between O&M and investment. So uh, the notion that they've got here is you, you, after your AFIT payback tour, you go to a MAGCOM, uh, then usually after a MAGCOM, you usually get set up for a squadron command. Then after that squadron command, uh, you know, they'll bring you back maybe to staff FM, maybe on the investment side, maybe on the O&M side. Okay. And they just kind of have you going back and forth um, so you, you can alternate between both the, the O&M and the acquisition type job. So this is, you know, kind of a, a different model. Um, trying to, you know, bring out the fact that they need their senior leaders to have the analytics um, and the decision support side that, uh, that the cost folks can, can bring to the table. All right, so all that's great. The question is, uh, how do you get in, right? What's the, what's the admission requirement? So the first one, uh, undergraduate degree. Well, that's going to be easy. Uh, I'm sure everyone in that room to, to be where they're at has their undergraduate degree. Um, so what are we looking at? Well, the first thing we're looking at is your, your undergraduate GPA. So you have to have a GPA of 3.0 as a Q, um, and a math uh, cumulative GPA of 3.0. Now, that, does that mean if you have a 2.9 or a 2.8 or a 2.7 that we're not going to accept you? No. Uh, if you meet the minimum, you're going to be academically eligible for the program, and no one's going to see, no one's going to have to review outside of our admissions counselors your package. If you fall below uh, one of these, then it, your application will get flagged and it will come to our department and we'll review it and see whether we can uh, grant you a waiver or not. Okay, so uh, if you have a 2.7 or a 2.8 or a 2.9, um, don't, don't let that stop you from applying. Um, waivers not only can they be granted, but um, they often are granted. The other thing you need is a standardized test in the last five years. So uh, most people take the GRE. Uh, this gives you the minimum for the, the GRE, both the verbal and the math. Um, and the, the 153 and the 148, that's the, the scale that came into effect uh, post-August of 2012. If you took it before then, uh, got the old numbers, 500 for verbal, 600 for math uh, on there. Uh, if you don't want to take the GRE, you can also take the GMAT. And if you do the GMAT, uh, you need to get a 550, eventually. So, you know, if you fall short in one or more of those areas, um, still apply, uh, that certainly doesn't rule you out. Um, we're going to look at the, the whole uh, academic uh, package to, to make a judgment um, on that. Okay, so, so you know, don't let anything like that stop you from applying. Um, you should always uh, apply and, and good things can, can happen. And, and if you're really borderline, um, we'll give you suggestions um, on ways that you can uh, improve to, to get accepted. looking like? Well, our 2014 students just showed up, um, 13 of those. Uh, so 2015, uh, that's the, the students who would start in August of 2015, that process is nearly complete. Uh, there were 12 military slots, and uh, the civilians are still being looked at between one and three civilians that are going to show up. So somewhere between 13 to 15 students which we'll have in 2015. Um, that really is kind of wrapping up and, and is near complete. Uh, so there's not there's probably not much of an opportunity for you there. Your opportunity really is uh, 2016. Uh, the final number of positions are not uh, done yet. They go through a process, an Air Force process uh, this fall, um, where they determine how many uh, military slots that we have. Uh, the going in position from, from staff at them is 12 slots again. Um, I think they'll be fairly successful in getting a number close to that. Uh, that would really be probably your first opportunity to, to take advantage of this. Uh, 12 is kind of the, the, the number that staff FMC wants to have uh, in perpetuity, so you kind of expect that as kind of a, a normal number. Uh, the program I've is 1982, and when I did the math on that, it's about 10 has been the average since 1982. So that gives you some, some idea. So if you're, if you're interested in this, if I've told you that getting a free education plus getting paid at the same time is the, the best job in the Air Force, um, there's really kind of this two-part process to, to get selected. Uh, the first one is on the AFIT side. So uh, AFIT 
often has to mean that you are more, quote unquote academically eligible. Okay? And that's really those criteria that I showed you on the, a couple of slides ago with the GPAs and the test scores. If you meet those minimums, you'll automatically get a letter that says you're academically eligible. If you don't meet some of those minimums, you'll get reviewed by our department, um, and then hopefully uh, you'll get a letter that says you're academically eligible um, for the program. And this is a continuous process. So you can do this tomorrow. Okay? You can do this next month. Uh, you can do it next week. Uh, there's no time frame to become academically eligible. But it's the first step that you need to do in order to be um, considered by AFPC to get selected. So I highly encourage you, regardless of you know, what your GPA is, what your GMAT is, uh, go ahead and, 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 uh, and apply uh, at the website that I've got there and, and get that academic eligibility uh, letter. And then, once that happens, um, uh, AFPC comes out with their advanced academic degree speed call. And that usually happens uh, around May. So uh, you can expect May of 2015 to see this call. It should be one of those AMS generic emails that say, hey, we're soliciting applicants for a whole host of programs, uh, and amongst those is going to be AFIT. Okay? Uh, so you'll then have to do, you'll have to give AFPC that academic eligibility letter. Uh, and then they'll ask you for some other things like your 3849 um, and those types of things. And then AFPC will actually select you into the program. And, and they're going to be notifying um, students in the, in the late fall. So, um, you know, it's going to be probably November or so of 2015 when they would notify, notify you for a, a start date in 2016. Uh, so that's really the process. Um, that's a little bit about the, the program. Um, uh, well, I'll just kind of open it up. Or, are there any questions that I can I can answer for you guys um, about the program? Yes, we've got two questions. Let me go with the LT first, then Ms. Young second. Graduate Services, this is Hannah Mascarella from the Air Force Base. I was wondering um, if you already have a master's degree, would it disqualify you from this program, or should you should you look at the PhD program, or what's the outlook? Um, so if you if you don't have it, it depends. I guess would be the answer. Uh, if you ha have not been sponsored by the Air Force for another master's degree, so if uh, like say USAFA had sponsored you for a master's degree, then then no, they're not going to send you here. If you did it on your own, um, you know, at night, uh, the weekends, what have you, then you're definitely not disqualified um, from this program. Uh, if you're just in the PhD program. Uh, there are PhD slots. There's one here for my position uh, at AFIT. There is uh, one uh, down at Maxwell. There are uh, two uh, at SAP FMC. Uh, and I believe there's one at uh, AFCA. Uh, so there's about five of them or so uh, that are possibilities for the PhD program. Um, I would be more than happy to, um, to talk a about the, what that's like in going through a PhD program and what some of the constraints are um, from, from that standpoint. Uh, if you're interested in, in the one here at AFIT, it's not going to come open for a few more years. Um, my replacement will show up in 2016, which means we'll be putting someone in the pipeline um, in 2017. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, Colonel. My name is Joy Young. I am the NAFA at Keesler Air Force Base. Sir, I wanted to know, I know that you're doing a push for the cost class, but are there other FM possibilities that are available to civilians um, at AFIT? Uh, there, there are not any other um, FM uh, master's degrees uh, here at AFIT. There was briefly um, a financial management master's degree here uh, about five or six years ago, but that program uh, is now defunct. So the only um, truly FM one is uh, the cost analysis program. Uh, we do have a bunch of other programs um, uh, that are they're all wonderful. Um, the issue would be to get released from uh, the career field to uh, to partake in one of those. Thank you, sir. Sir, I've got three questions for you. Number one, as with the Naval Postgraduate School, does AFIT have in-resident credit for Intermediate Development Education, IDE? So, um, that's a complicated answer. Um, 
we have uh, had um, IDE credit um, for certain programs in the past. So our system engineering program uh, does have an IDE program. The FM program, uh, the cost analysis program uh, does not. Understood. Okay. The second question for you, sir, is with master's degrees now being masked until the colonel's board, how does that impact your development team scoring weights? Right. Um, so, so those are those are different things, right? So one one's the promotion board, um, and, and the other is what the DT does when they're selecting people for schools and for um, uh, and for squadron command. Um, uh, my understanding is that DT process part of it, uh, the the AFID degrees are going to give more points. Um, I'll tell you what what Colonel Greiner, if anyone knows uh, Colonel Greiner, uh, we had a little uh, discussion um, on this this past week. And this is what he's telling his junior officers. Um, said, look, um, al although it's math uh, until the colonel's board, uh, as you get up in rank, you're going to have less and less time uh, and opportunity, really, um, to, to go get a master's degree. So he's encouraging his young officers, you know, hey, don't wait just because uh, the Air Force is going to map it to the to the 06 board. It's in your best interest to to take advantage of the opportunities that are out there, um, and 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 do it and do it when you're you're early on in your career, um, and 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 you have the, the time and, and the ability to, to to do it. So so that's his advice. You know, he's a he's an 06 who uh, you know was too below the zone to everything. Um, you know, a real fast burner. Uh, you know, potential general officer in our in our career field, and, um, and I think he's uh, got some, some pretty good points there. Last question for you, sir. Uh, in order to give a full range of perspective for our audience today, what other positions are there for folks to work at AFIT for enlisted, civilian, or officer? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so there are our, on the on the graduate school side, which is where I'm at. Uh, there is uh, my position, um, uh, which you would go into a PhD pipeline uh, for three years and then come into this position. That's one. Uh, we do, um, uh, every once in a while, uh, have um, uh, civilian hires um, for tenure track faculty. Uh, we actually just went through a process to, to try to hire someone for that um, uh, this past summer. Uh, on the continued education side, uh, there are, I believe, two uh, positions that are uh, CGO positions. So these are the people, uh, these are the classes that people come in for that are part of their continued education type classes, not the, the master's degree classes. And then there is one uh, civilian slot over there uh, on the continued education 